Hey everybody, I want to talk to you today about qualifying a buyer for a mortgage. When lenders look at buyers or borrowers, same thing, when they look at that borrower, it's first a question of do they qualify for a mortgage at all? And what's going to tell them that is going to be credit report, um, repayment history, those kinds of things. Once they come to an answer of yes, they qualify for a loan, then the more important question becomes how much of a loan? How much of a loan does this borrower qualify for? Obviously not every buyer, not every borrower qualifies for the same size mortgage because they can't afford to make the payment on an unlimited amount of money borrowed. So in this section what we're really asking ourselves is how much can this borrower afford to pay on a monthly basis? And that's how lenders come up with qualifying borrowers for a certain mortgage amount. It's not a question of if they just qualify, okay, they qualify, great. Now for how much? And the only way we can determine for how much is by knowing how much they can afford to repay and then looking at what that payment equates to as far as a mortgage amount. Now you're not going to have to look at what that payment equates to as far as a mortgage amount, but on the exam they do want you to know how to figure out how much exactly a borrower can afford to spend monthly on their mortgage payment. So we do that with something called a debt to income ratio. A debt to income ratio. Well ratio just means rate. Rate is the same thing as a percentage. So this is going to be a percentage based question. And it's a percentage of income. What we want to look at is how much monthly income. And notice I said monthly income, not annual income monthly income. How much monthly income does that borrower make? And then how much of that monthly income can they afford to pay back as their monthly house payment? We're going to look at just how much they can afford for a monthly house payment, but we're also going to look at how much they can afford to spend for their house payment plus all their other debt because people have lots of other debt like car payments or student loan payments or credit card bills and if you're the lender you have to be worried about how much other debt this person has because you have to be worried can they afford all of these payments obviously they, they're not paying their mortgage payment sort of by itself in a vacuum they're paying their mortgage payment in addition to all that other debt so we're going to look at two different ratios one only takes into account the housing piece of the puzzle how much is their house payment going to be? The other ratio that we're going to look at takes into account their housing and all of their other debt. Now when we do this, we use ratios, and I'm going to switch over here to a different screen. You'll see me switch back and forth several times. We usually use two different ratios, but I want you to start to think of this as buckets of money. So we have a bucket of money, and in this bucket of money, is all of our monthly income. This is our monthly income, all of it, no matter how much we make. So let's just say, for example, we make $5,000 a month. So $5,000 is in our bucket of income. We can't afford to spend $5,000 on our monthly house payment. Hopefully that's obvious, because if we were spending all $5,000 that we make on our monthly house payment, how would we afford to eat? How would we afford to have a car? How would we afford to put gas in that car or have food on the table or buy clothes or go to the movies or anything else? So no lender is going to qualify you for a loan where the payment is your full amount of income or 100% of your income. doesn't make sense. So the lenders are going to only qualify you for a percentage of, a piece of your monthly income. And that's where we come to these two debt to income ratios that we use. So I'm gonna draw two additional buckets here. Okay. My first bucket's terrible, so I'll redraw it. Not that I'm the best artist in the world. We've got two additional buckets here. One, we're gonna call the 28% bucket, and the other we're gonna call the 36% bucket. Now, why do we have two? The bucket on the left contains 28% of our monthly income. So whatever amount of income was in the big bucket up here, we took 28% of that. 
So in this case, that would be $5,000 times 28%. So if we do that math, I have to grab my calculator. If we do that math and we take $5,000 times 28%, what we find out is that we actually have about $1,400 available to spend in this 28% bucket. We also have another bucket of money over here, the 36% bucket. And in that bucket, we're going to put 36% of our gross monthly income. Gross means before we've taken out taxes, before we've taken out any expenses. So we take that $5,000, our full monthly income, and multiply by 36%, and we get $1,800 available to spend over on this side. Now this is not 1400 plus 1800 these are just two different buckets of money. Think of them as two different purses or two different wallets that you have money in. And you have to pay for different things out of each purse, each wallet, each bucket. So let's talk about what has to be paid for out of each one of these buckets. And I'm going to just draw a little dividing line here and scroll down. And we're going to talk about the differences in things that have to be paid for out of these buckets. On the 28% side of things, we have to afford our monthly housing expense. So we can afford up to, no more than, up to, 28% of our monthly income, in this case, $1,400, on our monthly house payment. And a house payment, remember, is principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. Now, if there were HOA dues, we would also include them here. You won't have that on a math question on the exam, but housing expense is everything associated with that ongoing house payment. So principal, interest, taxes, insurance, and HOA expenses, though you won't have that on a test. On the 36% side, we have to afford the exact same thing, monthly housing, but then it gets more complex. Monthly housing plus monthly debt monthly housing plus monthly debt. So why the two different numbers? The reason is we want to make sure this person, this borrower, is not getting overextended. They're not biting off more than they can chew. Remember, when you're qualifying a borrower, you're the lender. And that's what you have to remind yourself when you're answering this test question. You are the lender. You're trying to ask yourself, how comfortable am I with this person? So I want to make sure they don't spend more than 28% of their income on their house payment, but I also want to make sure they don't spend more than 36% of their monthly income on their house payment plus all their other debt. I want to make sure they're good on both sides. So the, the, the big important factor here on this question is to make sure you're checking both sides because a lender is going to want the borrower to qualify on both sides. We call this the front end ratio, and we call this one, the bigger one, the back end ratio. The front end ratio only covers the monthly housing expense. The back end ratio only covers, the, or covers housing plus all other monthly debt. So let's talk real quickly about what debt is and what is not debt. Debt is a car payment. Debt is a credit card bill, the minimum amount due on that credit card bill. Debt is a student loan payment. Debt is not an electric bill or a phone bill or dues to the Association of Realtors or dues to some club that you're a member of. Debt is not your monthly grocery expenditure. Debt is not your income taxes. Debt is something that you've borrowed money and you're making a structured monthly payment back on it. So those are the things we want to pay out of this bucket. This 36% bucket, we have to be able to afford to pay our debt. And what that means is that sometimes we're not going to be able to afford as much on a house payment. For example, 
it looks like we can afford $1,400 on our house payment here because if we make that $5,000 a month, remember where we started, we're making $5,000 a month. We said 28% of that $5,000 is $1,400. So it would seem like that borrower could afford to spend $1,400 on their house payment. But what if that borrower had, let's say, let's say they told us about this about the borrower. The borrower has a monthly car payment of $500. Now, we don't care about the car payment when we're dealing with the 28% bucket. But we do care about this car payment over on this side, that monthly debt side, because a car payment is most mo definitely monthly debt. So what, we have, what we've said here is that this borrower can afford to spend $1,400 on their house payment, up to $1,400 on their house payment, and up to or no more than $1,800 on their house payment plus their debt. Well, if the question is how much can they afford on their house payment, then we have to take the debt out of this bucket of money in order to figure out how much they can actually afford to spend on their house payment. So if we look at that, if we go back down here and we say, okay, well, we can afford $1,800 for house payment plus debt. And remember, I got that by simply taking my monthly income of $5,000 and then multiplying it by 36% because that's the amount of money they can afford to spend on both house payment plus debt. So when we look at that, we've got $1,800, which is right there, available for house payment plus debt. Well, $1,800, but we first have to pay our debt out of that. So if we pay our monthly car payment debt of $500, we're only left with $1,300 to spend on housing because we started with $1,800 available and we spent $500 of it on our monthly car payment. And that left us with $1,300 to spend on housing. Here's where people get sort of confused with this question. There's two different answers here. If you look at the 28% side, because the 28% side only calculates how much we can afford on house payment, the 28% side sort of ignores all of our other debt. And so if we didn't have any other debt, the 28% side says we can afford to spend up to $1,400 on the house payment. But remember, we have to also qualify under the other ratio. It's both at the same time. So we have to also look at the $1,800 side, the 36% side. We can afford up to 36% of our income for housing and debt. That's up to $1,800 for housing and debt. Well, if I pay that debt, that car payment of $500, that only leaves me with $1,300 available to spend on the 36% ratio. So just kind of to recap, the 28% ratio says we can spend up to $1,400. The 36% ratio says we can afford to spend up to $1,300 hundred dollars because we had to subtract out the five hundred dollars in debt first we had to pay the debt first and then we see what we have left over to pay our monthly house payment with so if you're the lender you're going to be faced with these two questions which one can they actually afford up to fourteen hundred dollars or up to thirteen hundred dollars remember you're the lender what you're most concerned with is can they make the payment. Can they make the payment? Which payment is it more likely that they're going to be safe making? Not which payment would you rather have as a lender, but which payment are they more safe in repaying? Are they more likely to be able to repay $1,400 a month, or are they more likely to be able to repay $1,300 a month? And the answer is they're more likely to be able to repay $1,300 a month. So if you're qualifying that buyer, that borrower, the house payment they can afford is $1,300 a month. 
because you've looked at both sides. You looked at the 28% side and it said you could afford to spend up to $1,400. You looked at the 36% side and you said, well, they could afford to spend up to a total of $1,800, but that was on house payment plus debt. So let me subtract out my debt, which leaves me with $1,300 available to spend. So when I'm comparing the two, they can afford to spend up to $1,400, they can afford to spend up to $1,300. The answer is they can only afford to spend up to $1,300, not the full $1,400. So we would only qualify them for the $1,300 monthly payment and whatever loan that equated to. All right. So I'm going to go through this little worksheet that I handed out in class and we're going to answer these questions and see how we can do with those. All right. Number one says calculate the maximum housing affordability for a uh, buyer who has a monthly gross income of $6,000 if there are no other known expenses. Well, we're still going to do both sides. We're going to figure out how much money is in the 28% side of things. We're also going to figure out how much money is in the 36% side of things. So we're going to take $6,000 and we're going to multiply it times 28%. We're also going to take $6,000 and we're going to multiply it times 36% because we've always got to check both. So when we look at this, $6,000 times 28%, we have $1,680 to spend on housing. Okay? When we take $6,000 and multiply times 36%, we have $2,160 to spend on housing. Sorry about that. Housing and debt. The question says there are no other known expenses. So these are our final numbers. There are no other known expenses. These are our final numbers. So the real question is, which one is the correct answer? Can they afford to spend $1,680 up to $1,680 and no more than that? Or can they afford to spend up to $2,160? Which one, if you're the lender, are you more comfortable with making this loan? You're more comfortable that they're going to be able to repay this loan. And the answer to that question is you're more comfortable that they're going to be able to repay the loan when they are making a monthly payment of $1,680. Number two says Tom is applying for a mortgage and has an annual income of $60,000. He has monthly total debt expenditures of $385. Based on this information, what's the total housing expense that Tom can afford when shopping for homes. So we're going to do the exact same thing again. We're going to take the 28% side of things. And so that means we're just going to take his monthly income. Now this time they've given us annual income. So the first thing we need to do, first thing, is take that $60,000 and divide it by 12. And that gives us, I believe $5,000 a month, $5,000 a month. So we have $5,000 a month income times 28%. And we also have, on the 36% side, $5,000 monthly income times 36%. So on the 28% side of things, so $5,000 times 28%, we can afford to spend $1,400 on housing. On the 36% side of things, we can afford to spend $1,800. And remember, that's on housing, on housing, and debt. On housing and debt. What they told us is that he has monthly total debt of 385. Well, when we have debt, we're not looking at this 28% side. Look what I wrote, and you need to write it out like that every time so that you're reminding yourself constantly. He can afford to spend up to $1,400 on housing. Well, that doesn't say anything about debt, so I'm not going to deal with debt on that side with it. 
you look at the 36% side, it says he can afford to spend $1,800 on housing and debt. Housing and debt. So if the question is, how much can he afford to spend on housing, I need to get rid of the debt. I need to take the debt out of the picture. So the way I take it out is subtract it. He has monthly debt of 385. So 1800 minus 385 tells us that he can afford to spend $1,415 on housing alone. So now the question is, which one is our best answer? Can he afford to spend 14, up to $1,400 on housing? Or can he afford to spend up to $1,415? on housing. Again, you're the lender. Which payment are you most comfortable with the borrower being, being able to make? Not which one makes you the most money as the lender, but which one are you more comfortable with the borrower being able to repay? And that's always going to be the lower payment. The lower payment is going to be the higher likelihood that they actually make the payment. There's not much of a difference here, but if you were qualifying this borrower, you would qualify them for $1,400 a month. And this is why you always have to look at both sides. You have to check the 28% side and the 36% side because you don't know where your answer is going to come from. Okay? Number three it says Bobby Byer has a monthly gross income of $4,850 with a car payment of $325, a student loan payment of $150, and, a credit, and credit card bills of $115. What's his monthly housing affordability? So we're looking at essentially the exact same things here that we've been looking at all along. All right? It says Bobby Byer has monthly gross income of $4,850. So we're going to take $4,850 and we're going to multiply it times 28%. We're also, because we've got the 28% ratio over here and how much we can afford. We also have the 36% ratio and how much we can afford there. And so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to take that $4,850. And we're going to multiply it times 36% because we've got to know how much money we have available on each side. On the 28% side, 4850 times 28%, he has $1,358 to spend on housing. On the 36% side, we're going to take that 4850 and multiply it times 36%. And he has $1,746 to spend on housing plus debt. So housing and debt. Well, the question is, what can he afford to spend on monthly housing? They want to know just the housing piece of the puzzle. So in order to figure that out, we need to get rid of the debt portion. We need to get rid of the debt because we have housing here. We can, okay, he can afford to spend $13.58, but we don't know how much he can afford to spend from the other side, and we always have to check both. So let's get rid of the debt on the other side so we know. He has a car payment of $325. Well, that's debt, so it needs to be paid. We've got to pay that out of this $17.46. He has a student loan payment of $150. That's also debt, so it needs to be repaid. And he has credit card bills of 115 That's also debt that needs to be repaid. So he's got a fair amount of debt going on here. And the lender's going to be concerned about that because it's going to affect the ability to repay that loan. So we're going to make sure that they can afford this thing. 1746 minus 325 in debt, minus 150 in debt, minus 115 in debt. We end up with $1,156 available for just housing because now we've taken the debt out. So the question becomes which one is our correct answer? Again, can he afford to spend $1,358 on housing or can he afford to spend $1,156 on housing? And if you're the lender, you're more comfortable that they can afford the lower payment. So the correct answer here on how much that borrower can afford in a monthly payment is $1,156. Number four says Sandy wishes, wishes to purchase a home and she has an income of $48,000 annually. If Sandy's interested in a home that would have a monthly PITI payment of 
How much can she afford for other monthly debt, such as car payments? Okay, so this one's being asked a little bit differently because they want to know how much can she afford for other monthly debt. But we're still going to do the exact same thing that we've done previously. We're simply going to look at a 28% ratio and a 36% ratio. Now, they tell us she has $48,000 annual income, so we've got to get rid of that. $48,000 divided by 12. So one of the most important things you can study, just as a side note for the math, for the class, is which formulas use monthly numbers versus which formulas use annual numbers, because that's going to be a big sticking point. With income, when we're talking about debt to income ratios, we use monthly income when we're qualifying a buyer, and that's because they're qualifying them for a monthly house payment, okay? So monthly income, $48,000, divided by 12 is going to be $4,000 a month. So we're going to take that $4,000 monthly, and we're going to multiply it by 28%. We're going to take that $4,000 monthly, and we're going to multiply it by 36%. When we do that, we have $1,120 to spend on housing. When we do 4,000 times 36%, we have $1,440 to spend on housing plus debt, housing and debt combined. Now the question is, how much can we afford to spend in Debt. That's what they want to know. Previously, they wanted to know in the other questions, they wanted to know how much we could afford to spend on housing. But in this one, they want to know how much we can afford to spend on debt. So, if they want to know the debt piece of that, then we need to subtract out the housing piece of that. Over here, the 28% side tells us a lot about housing, but it doesn't tell us anything about the debt. So, there's no way to get to the, the a debt payment, how much we can afford on debt from the 28% side, so we're just going to leave that number alone. But on the 36% side, it's housing plus debt. So if you've got two things together in a bucket, and you only want to know how big one of them is, the best way is to take the other one out of the bucket. So we've got housing and debt in the bucket. We want to know how much, how big the debt is, how much we're paying for debt. So let's get rid of the housing. And what they tell us in this question is that we have a monthly PITI payment of $940. So that means we're spending 940 of this 1440 on the house payment. So if we subtract that out, that will tell us exactly how much we can afford to spend on the debt. So 1440 minus 940 is $500 left over. So I have $500 left over after I pay my monthly house payment to spend on debt. So that's my final answer. I can afford to spend up to $500 monthly on a debt payment. Number five says, Tony is applying for a $200,000 mortgage in which the monthly payment amortizes at $5.21 per $1,000 of loan amount. That's a loan factor. Remember, it's just a payment for every $1,000 that's been borrowed on that loan. The annual taxes are $2,400 and the annual insurance is $1,200 on the property. Here's why that's going to matter. Remember, housing expense includes P-I-T-I, principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. Tying is paying a monthly car payment of $350 and student loan payments of $150 monthly. She has annual income of $62,000. Based on this information, which of the following is the best answer to her qualification status? So here's what you should probably do on a question like this. Let's just start grouping things together. You know, you've got the 28% side. And so let's talk about both the 28% side and the 36% side of what we pay. We know the 28% side is just housing. We know that. So let's find these things in here that are, or let's put these things in the column they go in, right? So the first thing is they tell us that the mortgage amortizes at 521 per thousand. That's the principal and interest piece. So 521 per thousand times 
200, because we're borrowing 200,000, should tell us how much the monthly mortgage payment is. So $5.21 times 200. The monthly principal and interest mortgage payment is $1,042. So we got to pay $1,042 out of this 20% bucket. We also got to pay it out of the 36% bucket. Because remember, the housing expense is on both sides. It's in both pieces. So we've dealt with that. This is the annual taxes are $2,400. Well, annual taxes doesn't tell me a lot, but monthly taxes does. So if I take that $2,400 and divide it by 12, I've got $200 in monthly taxes. So this is the PI, I'm gonna label it. This is the $200 a month in taxes. I'm gonna label that. And we've got to pay it out of both buckets because remember the housing expense comes out of both sides. We also know that there's annual insurance of $1,200 a year. And again, $1,200 a year doesn't tell me a lot, but $100 monthly does. If it's $1,200 a year and we divide that by 12, that tells us that we have $100 a month that's going toward insurance. And remember, the insurance is part of the housing expense. So it goes in both buckets. We got to pay it out of both sides. Okay. Here's what else it tells us: Talia is paying a monthly car payment of three fifty. Well, that's debt. Debt only comes out of the thirty six percent side. So we got a three hundred fifty dollar car payment. And student loan payments of $150 monthly. That's also debt. So we're going to put that in the 36% side. So $150 on her loan. She has an annual income of $62,000. Again, annual numbers don't help us a lot. So we want to take that $62,000 and divide it by 12. That gives us monthly income of $5,166. So we're going to take that $5,166.67 on both sides. Just write it down, $5,166.67. That's our monthly income. Which of the following is the best answer to her qualification status? Well, we need to check to see if she qualifies at all. So, we need to multiply this number times 28%. And when we do that, we figure out 516667 times 28%. She can afford $1,446.67 on the 28% side. If we do the same work over on the 36% side and multiply that monthly income times 36%, she can afford to spend 51.66.67 times 36%. She can afford to spend $1,860 even on the 36% side, $1,860 even. Question is, can she afford either of those? Well, look at what she's spending on the 28% side. She's spending 1,042 plus 200 plus 100. If we add all of those together, 1,042 plus 200 plus 100, that's $1,342. $1,342 means she qualifies on this side because it's less than the amount of money she has to spend. She has 1,446. Another way you could do this is you could simply say 1,446.67 minus 1,042 minus 200 minus 100. If she has money left over, and in this case she has over $100 left over, she qualifies. So we're just going to put a check mark on the 28% side. She qualifies under that ratio. Let's look at the other side. 
On a 36% side, she can afford to spend $1,860. So we're going to start to subtract out all of these various expenses from that so that we can figure out if she has enough money on that side. 1860 minus 1042 minus 200 minus 100 minus 350 minus 150. She has $18 left over, so she also qualifies under the 36% ratio because she has just barely enough money with a whole $18 to spare left over. So now I'm going to go look at my answer choices and find one that hopefully says she qualifies under both sides. Answer choice one says Tanya qualifies only under the 28% ratio. That's false she qualifies under both. Answer choice two says Tanya qualifies on, only under the 36% ratio. That's also false because she qualifies under both. Number three says Tanya qualifies under both ratios. That's true. And number four, Tanya does not qualify under either ratio. That's most definitely false because she qualifies under both. So your correct answer to that question is that Tanya qualifies under both ratios. That is very similar to the kind of test question you might expect to see on a buyer qualification question. Being able to look at both ratios and say, does she qualify under one side, both sides, or neither side? And in this case, she qualified under both. Notice we had to check both. She had, she had enough money over here. She also had enough money over there. She's good on both sides. Now, to this point, we have, and you'll see this in your handout, We've talked about qualifying somebody for a payment amount. How much can they afford to spend on a monthly payment amount? And that's very valuable information. Equally valuable information is taking a payment amount and telling us how much income does that person need in order to qualify for that payment amount. Sort of asking the question in reverse. It's using the same 28 and 36 ratios, except this time, instead of multiplying income times the ratio, it's going to be expenses divided by the ratio to tell us the income. So, you know, if you want to look at that as a T-bar, your T-bar for this looks like this. It's monthly income. And ratio on the bottom and on the top it's monthly expenses. Now the same rules apply from earlier when we're talking about the 28% ratio. So if the ratio we're using here is 28% then the expenses that are up here are just the housing expenses. If we're talking about the 36% ratio down here then the, the, the expenses that are up in the top portion there are the housing expenses plus all the other monthly debts. You have to keep in mind and still keep those things grouped together. So number six is Thomas is attempting to qualify for a monthly PITI payment of $2,000 and does not have any monthly debt expenses. What's needed to, in monthly income for him to qualify? We still want to look at the 28% side and the 36% side on these questions. On these kind of questions, we still need to look at both of these ratios. Here's what we know. They have to afford, or they want to afford, a $2,000 monthly PITI payment. Well, the PITI payment comes out of the 28% bucket. It also comes out of the 36% bucket. So we need to check, check and deal with it on both sides. If we had other debt, we would list it on the 36% side. We don't have any other debt, so we're going to leave that alone. So we go back to our formula, and the formula says monthly expenses divided by the ratio will tell us monthly income. Well, that's what they're asking us for. What's needed? Oops, sorry about that. What is needed in monthly income? What is needed in monthly income for them to qualify? They want to know the income piece. So again, if we go back and look at our T-bar, monthly income, we're going to get by taking monthly expenses and dividing by the ratio. So if we look at these two ratios, we've got monthly expenses of $2,000. So it's going to be $2,000 to 
divided by the ratio, which is 28%. On the other side, on the 36% side, it's going to be $2,000 because that's the total expenses on that column divided by 36%. So when we do that, calculator, $2,000 divided by 28% would be an, a monthly income of $7,142.86 that that person would need to qualify. $2,000, again on the other side, divided by 36%, would be a monthly income of $5,555.55 that that person would need to qualify for. So again, just like in the earlier questions, we've got two different answers here, but only one of them is really the correct answer for how much income this borrower needs in order to qualify, because we need them to qualify under both sides. Put yourselves in the position of the lender again. Earlier, when the question was, how much of a payment could the borrower afford? We said that the lender was more comfortable with a borrower who has a lower monthly payment. That's not the question this time. The question this time is, how much income do they need? Think about it for a second. If you're talking about the lender qualifying the borrower, which income level is the lender going to be more comfortable with? Is the lender going to be more comfortable with a borrower who makes over $7,000 a month or a borrower who makes $5,500 a month? And the answer is the lender is going to be more comfortable with a borrower who makes $7,142 a month. So therefore, that's how much this borrower would need to make in order to qualify for this loan. That's why you always have to check both sides because you don't know which side the answer is coming from. Okay? Number seven, if Sally wants a monthly PITI payment of $1,580 and has monthly debt of $615, what does she need to make monthly in order to qualify? So same rules apply here. We're going to take the 28% ratio. We're going to take the 36% ratio. And we're going to start grouping things together. She wants a monthly PITI payment of $1,580. Well, that's going to go in both sides because we've got to pay the house payment in both columns. So 1580. PI She has monthly debt of 615. Well the debt has nothing to do with the 28% ratio, so it's only going to go over here on this side. What does she need to make monthly to qualify? What does she need to make monthly? So they want to know income. If I go back to my T-bar, the only way to calculate income is to take the total expenses and divide by the appropriate ratio. Well, on the 28% side, my math is going to simply be 1580 divided by 28%. On the 36% side, it's going to be 1580 plus 615 total of 2195 divided by 36%. So 1580 divided by 28% is $5,642.86 in monthly income needed. 2195 divided by 36% is 6000 $97.22 in monthly income needed. You're the lender. Which borrower are you more comfortable with? The borrower who makes $5,600 a month or the borrower who makes a little over $6,000 a month? The answer is you're more comfortable that the borrower who makes $6,000 a month is going to be able to repay their loan than the borrower who makes $5,600 a month. More money, more likely they're going to be able to make the payment. This is your answer. That's how much they qualify for. And last one we're going to go through here. Assumes Beth, assume that Beth's monthly PI payment is $785 and the home she wishes to purchase has a yearly tax bill of $1,200 with annual homeowner's insurance of $600. 
Beth also has a car payment of $350 and monthly association of realtors dues of $65. What would Beth's annual income need to be in order to qualify using the 2836 qualification guidelines? So we're going to just start the same way we have every single time. 28%. 36% and we're going to start grouping things together. Monthly PI payment. That's a house payment. That's the mortgage payment. That's the principal and interest. It's going on both sides. $785. We've got to pay it out of both of those buckets. The home she wishes, wishes to purchase has a yearly tax bill of $1,200. Taxes is part of the house payment, but not yearly. So we want to take that $1,200 and divide it by 12 to get the monthly house our monthly tax bill of hundred dollars and we have to be able to pay that so we're going to put PI here label things we have to be able to pay those taxes out of both the 28 percent bucket and out of the 36 percent bucket we've got annual homeowners insurance of six hundred dollars that's fifty dollars a month six hundred divided by twelve 50 bucks a month. We got to be able to pay the insurance out of both of these buckets. So $50 a month in insurance coming out of both buckets. Beth also has a car payment of $350. Car payment is debt. Debt is only on the 36% bucket. So we're going to put that debt at $350 the car payment only on the 36% side. And then monthly association of realtors dues. Who cares? It's not a house payment. It's not part of a house payment. It's not a homeowners association dues. Association of realtors dues. That's what you would have once you get your license if you decide to join the association of realtors. It's nonsense. It's like a cable bill or a phone bill or an electric bill. It's useless information. It doesn't matter at all. It's not debt and it's not house banking. Get rid of it. What would Beth's annual income need to be in order to qualify using the 28-36% qualification guidelines? Well again, they want to know what would Beth's income need to be. They want to know her income. And what we've learned is that when they want to know income, and I'll scroll back up here to the T-bar, when they want income, we're simply going to take the monthly expenses and divide by the appropriate ratio. So, on the 28% side, we got monthly expenses of 785 plus 100 plus 50. If we add all that together, you get a total of $935 a month. And we're going to divide that by 28%. Nine thirty-five divided by twenty-eight percent. We would need a monthly income of three thousand three hundred thirty-nine dollars and twenty-nine cent. We look at the other, the thirty-six percent bucket. We need seven eighty-five for the PI payment, a hundred dollars for the taxes, fifty dollars for the insurance, and three hundred fifty dollars for the car payment. That is twelve hundred and eighty-five dollars. And we're going to divide that by 36%. That tells us we need a monthly income of $3,569.44. So again, the question is, which is it? Is it that they need to make $3,300 a month? or they need to make $3,500 a month. You're the lender. It's in your control. Which loan do you feel more comfortable with? Which borrower do you feel more comfortable with? The borrower who makes $3,300 a month or the borrower who makes $3,500 a month? And when I'm talking about income, I'm always more comfortable with people making more money because the more money they make, the more likely they are to be able to make that house payment. So the correct answer of how much Beth qualifies for here is $3,569.44 in monthly income. They wanted to know annual, so simple, 
take that monthly income, 35.69 and 44 cents, and multiply it times 12, and that gives us a annual income for Beth of $42,000. $833.28. $42,833.28. So you should be able to go back through this video a few times if you have questions about buyer qualification, and I wish you well. Thanks.